you know, I'm really humbled by what you say, and yet, I, and yet, I, I don't believe some of it in a sense too. Mm. I just think I'm a dude that maybe, maybe I'm, um, I inspire a few folks because I tell people what I do. Mm. You know, I think there's a bloody lot of people out there that do amazing things that don't put it out there and, mm. and aren't storytellers either naturally or want to be. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think there's a fair bit to that. You know, where it's just, it really is just three three lads talking in a room and, and no one's better than anyone else and yeah. I just happen to have made stories about the thing I things I do <laughs> sometimes, you know. But that's yeah. why we like you so much, mate, because you've uh, there's a that little bit of humility goes a long way, I think, and it's just an honest uh, that's sort of your honest baseline, which is cool. And I think people connect yeah. with that, you know? Yeah, I I hope so, because um my heroes are like that too, you know, that uh I remember adventurers came through um when I was a school kid and they'd put them up on the stage and, and they'd tell us about all these pearls of wisdom, but they never had that sort of sense of the everyday about them. Mm. And I thought you bloody are, or you were, or you should be. <laughs> and <laughs> so I, I see a hole in the sort of game there. Yeah. yeah, well. yeah. Cool stuff. Good afternoon there, Bo Miles. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast, bud. Good. Yeah, thanks for having me, Gareth. Yeah, cool, man. But listen, you're, you're definitely one of the, the most fair dinkum and like inspiring people I've actually watched on YouTube. Um, it, it, ha it was a really cool story, actually. A, a friend of mine, a guy called Chris Guy, he WhatsApped me probably about a month ago. And he's like, he's, you've got to check out this, uh, this guy on, on YouTube. And, and it was you. And it was the video that you created of a mile an hour run. And I watched it, bud. And I was like, so I was like literally captivated and hooked the second. I was, and then I just kind of went down a kind of rabbit hole exploring your uh, YouTube kind of channel. And I was watching these videos. I was like, wow, this looks cool. And um, <laughs> You know, then thanks to kind of like social media now, everyone kind of gives it a little bit of grief, but I think we're living in such amazing times. And I was like, I'm going to get all this guy on flipping Instagram, message you, you got back to us. You're like, yep, no worries, fellas. You're such like, you, were, mm -hmm. you replied exactly how you kind of come across on your videos. And I was like, sweet, he's keen. <laughs> and um, <laughs> here we are. So thanks for, for joining us again, my man. Um, a good chat, yeah. Yeah, definitely, bud. So, so... I just want to give like a little bit of a quote here because I was, I don't know, I was reading something the other day and um, there was a quote uh, from Seneca and it's about the shortness of life. And even though like I flip and know you from a bar of soap, you know, um, I, from just from what I watched from you on YouTube, I think it kind of sums up your philosophy on life pretty well. Um, so I'm just going to quickly read it out if you don't mind and I don't, you know, don't want to butcher it at all. So the quote is... It is not that we have a short time to live, but that we waste a lot of it. Life is long enough and a sufficiently generous amount has been given to us in the highest achievements, if it were all well invested. But when it is wasted in heedless luxury and spent on no good activity, we are forced at last by death's final constraint to realize that it has passed away before we knew it was passing. So it is, we are not given a short life, but we make it short. And we are not ill-supplied, but wasteful of it. Life is long if you know how to use it. And I don't know, this is the kind of message that sort of seems to come across in, in, your, in your videos. Like you've got to make the most of life, you know, and uh, spend your hours wisely. Um, so I don't know, that's just kind of like sums you a little bit up for me. I don't know if you, if you kind of like, you know, feel that way as well. I think so. We, we sort of go through eras. Uh, at least I feel like I'm in an era or in an age where you think you're in an era. And so you sort of, uh, you know, I, I've lived as many adult years now as I did as a, as a non-adult. Um, and I'm now a parent for, for the first time. And so, you know, I think a lot of people have their, their crises at 50 or 60 when they're, I don't know, you know I'm not that old. I don't know what it feels like, but, um, mm. I can imagine that it's very easy to have a crisis at, at my age too. I've just turned 40, new father. I've lived as many adult years as non. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking, okay, you know, here's a reality check. And what are you doing with your life? And I've got a great life. I always have. But is it exactly what you want to do? And if not, then make some tweaks, make some changes. Uh, but ultimately too, I think um, we've talked about uh, in a few email exchanges up to this point that 
I, I am generally, I don't want, I'm scared of death. And, and I say that in a kind of, you know, realistic way. And I just, I just want to do lots of stuff. Um, it, it's, it's coincidental what you were saying there. I, I was also reading some, some philosophy from Sartre recently, and he actually speaks about, um, and you, and obviously this ties into your story, obviously, but, but um, the facticity and transcendence. So like when you reach 40, what is the story you've told yourself? What is, what is the, what are the facts about you versus what are the possibilities that lay ahead for you in your life? And um, it sounds like you've really like, you sort of delved into this and thought about it quite a lot and, uh, and, and yeah. thought into this. That's a lovely way of putting it. Um, you know, our potentials and I forget the word you said in the opening of that, that um, question, but facticity and transcendence. Yeah. Facticity. I don't know much about facticity, um, but philosophically speaking, I, I I'm very much um, a PhD does that to you as well uh, in that it makes you really critical of what is reality and what is your own reality. And, and, and through that process of writing a PhD, identity very much came up. And what is the story you're telling to others? And that could be to a million people, or it could be to your, your girlfriend or your wife or your mum and dad. What's your story? You know, yeah. What do they describe you as if they had to, if they were really pushed into a corner and had to fundamentally and ultimately and truthfully to say what you are, what, what is the story they're saying? Because in many respects, that's the story you're telling. I suppose, mm. selling to them. Mm. Um, what myth are you kind of pushing around there? And there's lots of academics that talk about us making myths about ourselves. And yeah, I just, I suppose I hit a stage where I thought, well, what's my myth? What's my story? And, you know, how can I kind of add to that? But it was never, it's never this, you know, this is me talking about it to you in these very clinical sort of vacuum spaces. It never mm. happened to me a lot, like a lightning bolt like that. Mm. I just think that this is all retrospective of, oh shit, I've got my act together the last... 10 years and doing things quite differently and questioning things in a different way. And that's probably it. Yeah. So, so what do you think your, your folks would say about you, Brad? Well, it's, a, it's, that is the question because um, we'd have to really put them in, we'd have to really corner them, you know, <laughs> and um, I wrote a, I wrote an assignment profile with a friend of mine recently about writing obituaries. You know, if our environment goes, how would you talk about the environment in terms of an obituary? And, and I think a lot of people often hmm. think about how people would talk about us at our funeral. And I'm not sure what my parents would say, you know, I'm sure they'd say all the parenty things that they've got to say. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the other stuff about what I would think about as being my identity, I'm not sure, you know, hmm. I, I'm, I think they see one version of bone, not necessarily the one I'm selling to all the others, you know, <laughs> and, and what was the what was the synopsis basically of what the obituary would look like for for nature when it's when it's gone? Well, that's just it. We position it, we position it through these ideas of things like land ethic and uh, morality, um, and even even sort of uh, ecology and, and the anthropocentric scale of where humans fit within a bug or a tree or whatever else. And so we we just get the the students to question where where other things fit in their identity and and when those things go how does it impact you and we're trying to personalize you and a tree and a bug and a healthy river and and when it goes how do you feel about it you know mm -hmm. um when someone dies on the other side of the world it's very abstract and it's very easy not to give a shit but if mm -hmm someone dies in your family or someone you know then obviously it hurts and so they think about it in a different way um and so something like an obituary death this final act this thing is a very powerful learning tool and so uh we use that wow so so obviously you you are a particularly philosophical guy and, and it's, as you mentioned studied a phd in philosophy but with a surname like Miles, you surely were destined <laughs> to do all the running and other adventures in your life as well. Yeah, what is that called? You know, when someone's a blacksmith and they're called John Smith? Yeah. What's, that called? <laughs> What's that called? It's a something. And I always want to, because everyone says that. Yeah, I do. You must be, your, you know, your Miles. Um, so, yeah, my best mate's called uh, Paul Rowbottom. So I'm not sure what that says about him. <laughs> Well, he obviously joins oh, you on, on a lot of those kayak, kayak trips, but his <laughs> name is right. Robottom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, classic. But so, so uh, just uh, Chris, the guy who I mentioned who introduced me uh, to you, he actually, he just kind of wanted to know 
like where your desire to explore originated from? I think in many respects, um, I, I couldn't tell you. I really couldn't. And, I, and it, uh, that's a retrospective thing that I think often adults fill in the gaps. And it's, it's what we, it's, we, we put our adult brain across decisions we made a long time ago that we're not sure where they came from. I, I kind of, I have a vague idea of the parenting that my parents gave me. Um, and that was fairly free in a sense, you know, they were kind of hippie-ish parents and both pretty busy and uh, mum's a gardener and dad's an artist. And um, they, I suppose what they gave me was tremendous freedoms and they didn't believe in boredom. They hated the idea of boredom and I kind of grew up with that. I've never been bored a day in my life or a minute in my life. I just don't, when my brain is functioning, um, I'm not sure how someone can be bored, you know, mm. bloody get creative and make fill in the gaps, you know? So um, I think maybe that's what they gave me this sense that create your own fun, create your own uh, sense of curiosity and don't bug me because you've got the potential to like any human to just go and make something of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, so like, they just like, we're pretty encouraging as, as parents then. Yeah, yeah, encouraging in a non-encouraging way, if that makes sense. So they, they never were righteous about what's going to make you a good human, Bo. But I, and I think maybe they bloody lucked out and they kind of, they did a good job of facilitating <laughs> someone who, who is going to go and make it. He's got ambition, burn, and, or, or I don't think I've always had that, by the way, but I've always been curious. Um, and then got to an age at say 20 where I realized my body's good to be able to sort of abuse or can do these things. And I'm quite, um, kinesthetic, you know, I like climbing trees and running places and paddling places. And so bang, you know, you've got this body that can take your places to satisfy your curiosity and, and they let me do it. So the way it went. Yeah, you mentioned you weren't always super motivated. Is, was there a time in your life where you remember like having to find motivation to do stuff? Yeah, once again, it's like I'm not sure where that seed came or that sort of wind of change or whatever. Um, and there's a big difference, I think, too, in something like motivation and ambition. Mm. Um, you know, one, and that's an academic thing, too. They, you, you question the etymology of words and, and what you take them to mean. And so I, I think I'm very, very ambitious now, but I'm toning it down. Um, based on a four month old child in the other room and, a, and, a, and, a, and, and, and that's a hell of an adventure too, you know, but um, yeah, university. All right. If I was to say, okay, here's Bo now doing all these things at university from the ages of 19 through to 23, say my undergrad stuff, I wasn't ambitious. I just wanted to have fun and drink lots of beer and, mm. and meet as many women as I could. And, and just, it was this real epoch of time of, of four years where the world can wait. You know, mm. I, I wasn't ambitious to be anyone or anything or known. I just wanted my five best mates and, and whatever. So I think as soon as I came through the university cycle, it was very much a right. Oh, game on. Let's st let's start to let's start to imprint yourself in in careers or a pathway of writing or films or whatever. Love mm. it. Yeah, it's I'm, cool. I'm very sure lots of people feel similarly in university, and then that sort of lingers afterwards too there'll be like another milestone well, when I've got a serious job, then I'll get serious. So clearly you just had something in you that's got you going. You know? Well, you know what? Interestingly enough, I've been in the university sector now for over 10 years and I've now just stepped away from it weeks ago. So I'm in this new era of bow, but for that 10 years and I saw a transition of students and I was sort of maturing at the time as well. I think students actually are far more ambitious within their undergrad studies now more than me that they don't drive crap cars and live in cheap houses and just do shit for the sake of it. They mm. do things that are going to relate to their career from way earlier than me. Mm. Uh, they, they, they're trying to bolster their CV when they're 18 and 19. And I didn't give a damn for any of that stuff. <laughs> and I just wanted to go camping and whatever, you know? Yeah. So I think that I think our young students now in many respects are being forced into this sort of early career mode from earlier than even my generation, which isn't very old, you know? So I think mm. things have shifted. But do you and see what, that as a positive? Mm. Um, I fundamentally, I would think, no, I think people, yeah, I think the, the longer you can stave off adulthood, the better. Yeah. Adults yeah. are the things that screw over the world. You know, mm. a lot more than a child mentality or, in a sense, an unambitious mentality. 
um, that, or that at least that's one way of thinking of it, you know. For sure. Yeah, absolutely, bud. Uh, sure, man, that's super cool. So, but you literally are seriously like a man after my own heart, and uh, you you obviously set yourself all these amazing challenges and done epic things. Um, and one of the first ones that I that I kind of read about or, or watched was you hitchhiking from Alaska to Vancouver and then back again. Uh, wh- why do you think it's important to set ourselves challenges in life? Well, see, that, that was undergraduate bow too, when that was just a total stunt. So <laughs> whilst I would make a full-blown film about that now, and I took a camera along then when I was in, at uni, that was really just about a cool story to tell on Friday night at the pub. And we <laughs> left on Monday and the rules were we had to get back before the, you know, the pub was open on Friday type thing. So it was sort of the reason we do things is very, very different. Um, that, was, that was an amazing journey in the sense that it was sort of, it was starting, I was starting to realize the power of just something that was a bit off cuff and a bit odd as an adventure or something that's challenging um, can have just as much impact as these big, you know, paddling around chunks of South Africa or, or Africa and then going for big long runs. It doesn't always need to be a big long slog where you're the best in the world or at anything, you know? Mm. Yeah. What, 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 what was like any sort of cool things that happened on that hitchhiking trip? Cause that's quite a, quite a journey. Yeah, well, it was we were totally underprepared. We were just two punk Aussies that, you know, I was the outdoor kid, so I had a lot of the outdoor stuff, but my mate didn't. So by the time my <laughs> gear was watered down to him, we were both very cold and very hungry. And, and you know, um, we had rules where we could only eat from servos and, you know, we took it in terms of thumbing out the front and the other one would hide in the bushes. And um, yeah, I suppose some of the, you know, we got very, very cold. We did one stint underneath the boat underneath a tinny on the back of someone's <laughs> ute for two hours when it was bucketing snow oh. and it was freaking cold, you know? And oh. uh, yeah, we ended up having a real long hug for a couple of hours. <laughs> a nice little spoon and, in the back of it. <laughs> oh, mate, it was cold. <laughs> and in, if you can like cast your mind back to that sort of experience, were you thinking this is, this is making us stronger. This is great. Or is it like, oh my God, we're going to have a great story for the pub or literally like, what are we thinking? What are we doing here? Kind a of bit thing. of both, a bit of your latter two, you know, it, this is going to be a good story if we get through this. You know? And, um, <laughs> and geez, we can't get wait to get to that servo at the next uh, crossroads because we got there and we, we knew we were able to go into this 24 hour service station to get a hot cup of coffee or uh, some soup. <laughs> and yeah, it was, um, but yeah, it was, well, this better be a good story because this at the moment sucks. You know, well, I remember thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> so so you mentioned the rules and and sort of parameters for your challenges and and you you sort of this is somewhat of a theme with a lot of your, your mm. things that you do how do you sort of come up with them and, and why do you actually create some of these rules yeah that's a good pickup because um most people just think you're doing these sort of harebrained things and they're either hard or not or whatever but everything's hard uh if you make it a commute to work is bloody hard if you do it you know, without food or water, or if you walk rather than take a car. So it's just about saying, right, here's this idea I've got, and I'm going to strip back a few things to give it that sense of challenge or that sense of meaning or that sense of length. You know, when I drive to work, it takes an hour and 10. If you walk, it takes two days. So you've got this really sliding scale that you easily. And, you know, kids do that. You know, kids do that when they're when making a cubby house. You know, the, the, you could go and buy a ladder to get you to the top of the tree, but if you use crap, shitty wood that you've got to go and scavenge from your three next door neighbours to make pegs up a, you know, up the trunk of a tree, then that that has double, th- you know, it takes twice as long, mm. it's twice as bad, it has twice as much story, and yet it gets them to the top of the tree. So mm. I like just creating these, and they're completely redundant or, or arbitrary. You just put rules around things to to suit your um, requirements, you know. I actually just read a thing recently and they were talking about how life is obviously full of challenges and uh, an example of this uh, in, in, a, in an art form uh, creating parameters is, a, is like a haiku and within it's, it's not the a haiku is not necessarily the best language you could ever find um, obviously not but because of the challenge and the parameters uh, it that creates the beauty and and so by creating these in our lives, we can actually find 
beauty in, in things that we do. And um, yeah, I think it's kind of cool that you, and if we can find more of that in our day-to-day -day lives, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right, Craig. It's well said, you know, that I'm not, I'm not much of a poet, um, but I, I assume that, you know, people, a lot of people resonate with poetry because of the simplicity of it. And, and it's, uh, and it's sense of interpretation, you know, people mm -hmm. can read a, a poem and there, I suppose in, in some ways, very few people are going to read the same poem and think the same things. Mm -hmm. If you read a novel, you, you're likely thinking very similar things because of the detail. Right. And so you read that poem and um, it's going to resonate with you because of your particular life story and, all of your experiences and uh yeah our world around us is exactly the same you know um when you look at the when you look at something under a microscope it's very much look like looking through a telescope you know mm. our universe looks the same as a cell mm. and so uh you know your sense of perception is is your most powerful tool mm, no. yeah totally and like i guess people that like watch your videos are like you know they'll watch the same thing but but sort of pick up different things as well um so so just talking about um your videos obviously the the ma on our challenge was the one that like got got me into into you and um, i've actually watched it like i don't know quite a few times but then then i feel really 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 inspired by it and i'm like i'm also turning 40 like soon next year actually and i'm like what can i do for my 40th you know maybe i can do something like maybe i can like do okay 40 hours what can i com complete in 40 hours so you really inspired me and actually my mates as well because yeah. we uh, same as probably with you, your buddies, you know, you're all kind of like the same age and you're all kind of probably near the same sort of birthdays. And so we're trying to think of what can we all do together um, to do that. So, but maybe you can like, just for, for our you know, listeners, you can just give us a bit of an overview about uh, what it was and sort of how that came about. Well, it was, um, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of long and short versions of this is that something, a very simple and easy idea because ideas are easy, right? You're going to have lots of ideas. And this is a very easy idea had pretty, it pr had pretty simple and immediate resonance to be a, a film. And that was just thinking that, okay, um, I don't like running much now that's sort of uh, repeating things and, or just on a bloody road or running can be incredibly meaningless. And so I thought when I found out that my block is a mile long, I thought it, all right, so mile is a famous distance. My name is Bo Miles and I love my block, but I've never run really a mile before. And so I just, I started to layer up this thing that, all right, I've got a mile long block. Maybe if I run enough laps, I could run a marathon. Yeah, but now that's pretty boring. Why don't I just do one lap an hour and then in between do a bunch of things? So that sort of stemmed out of sitting and writing the, the last year of PhD is quite an intense time. You know, you've had all of these years of toiling away to get your data and your methodology and your theories and your writing and rewriting and you're getting better at writing all the time and you're getting fatter as you do it and you're sitting more. And I'm just sitting in this room in my house looking out over my lovely little farm and um, I can't really go outside because I'm under deadline. And, and so it was really, I remember thinking once, um, geez, I just want to get outside and go for a bloody run. And I just did a lap around the block. And I got back and I found kind of refreshed and barely had a sweat. But um, that, that was sort of the start of it. And, and that sort of, that was the seed of, oh, you know, this mile an hour thing, there's a film in this. And so I'm going to film that as soon as I hand the PhD. <laughs> and, and, and do you, like, any, like, greatest lessons from it at all? Like, that you... Oh, not really. You know, I tr you try to keep things pretty simple. I think I'm... I think I'm really, I say it in the film somewhere, I say I'm a pretty good idiot when I make a decision to do something. I don't think much more beyond, um, like I do now here talking to you, but mm. when I'm doing something that's quite practical and fundamental, like running or building a table, you know, they're very task. You've only got to make five or six decisions in, a, in, a, in an hour or, or mm. five minutes. You know, they're quite simple, simplistic things to do. And I kind of, trust myself with that to just be an idiot in small chunks and it, it's quite sustainable you can do it for a long time so um i, I suppose that's the aim of the game is that you, you can become really quite productive in life if you if you work in chunks that maybe overlap all the time and that have something to do with each other and that are different uh and different to what you would usually do <laughs> Very good. It's, it's it is super inspiring like literally I think there's very few people out there that won't be inspired at, at the very least to sort of be, to understand how much more one can do like that. Exactly what you're saying now, like, uh, and also 
um, like batching tasks and, and things like that. It's just incredible. Obviously, you won't, you wouldn't do that every day, but it's just amazing to know what more is possible in our lives. And it just sets that bar a little bit higher for, for everyone that's watched, which is so cool. But yeah. there's a lot of people in the world like that. And, and one of the people you mentioned was um, in your video was um, Cliff Young, actually. Yeah. And I wanted to mention it here just because a lot of people that aren't Aussies might not know about him, but um, it, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about him because he's quite a, a fascinating and, and inspirational guy as well. He really course. is. You know, he was massive in the sort of, I'd say, 80s and 90s, maybe the 70s as well. But I knew of him as a kid, you know, and he was he's a dairy farmer. I think he was dairy. And um, he was this sort of kooky fella that, that started a running race uh, by wanting to jog. I'm not sure if it was for charity, but he used to just run around a lot in his gumboots on the farm. So he was a fit sort of runner type anyway. And he ended up running from Melbourne to Sydney as a part of a race. And it was a stunt of some kind. And he had all these fit people do it as well. But he did, he went, it was very much the tortoise and the hare. You know, he went slower than everyone, but he just didn't stop. And he'd run in his gumboots along the road and he was jovial and he had a really good attitude and he was hard as nails and very likable, you know, um, and there's, yeah, he, he was kind of a legendary figure when we were kids that, you know, if you could do anything of distance or of long range, or if you were a bit of a hard oddball, then you were a clippy young, you know? <laughs> cool. I love it. And yeah, he was quite famous for his sort of shuffle, the cliffy shuffle or whatever. Yeah, there. <laughs> that's it. The cliffy shuffle, which I've been told recently I've got. And I thought, no, I don't. I look like a beautiful runner, but no, <laughs> apparently I'm a shuffler. <laughs> so, Bo, you actually um, recently be, became a dad to baby May, um, which is amazing. Congratulations. And Thank you. Um, uh, you married to the lovely Helen. Uh, you, you've also done some challenges with her, actually, and um, one of which was racing up a mountain road with her on her bike and, and you running. What is, in your opinion, the importance of like the sort of irrelevant husband versus wife challenges and, and these kinds of things? Well, I suppose um, I've always had really great relationships throughout my um, my life. You know, I've had really great girlfriends and great women around from my grandmother and my mother right through to girlfriends as such. But Helen takes the cake you know, tenfold because of her, um, oh, her sort of sense of the world and she's got this lovely carefree nature. She's very positive. And, and we kind of take the piss out of each other a bit, but in, but in the most loving of ways because, you know, the worst parts about my wife are the fact that she, you know, she drops a lot of crumbs and that she, she trips a lot and she drops things <laughs> and, you know, and yet she's this awesome athlete, right? So if they're the worst things about my wife, then I've landed in my, you know, my bum's in honey. So it's bloody good. Um, and I think just emphasising that on something like a silly little race up a hill, you know, um, and it's it just that sense of, yeah, that sense of physicality too, which I was always, I suppose, after in a, in a partner. Because she, she needs physicality probably more than me, you know, a ride or a run or a swim or something, mm. you know. Yeah, she's awesome. Oh, so cool, man. Yeah, I mean, it's really like, once again, but I don't know, it's really sort of encouraging and inspiring to other people just watching these things, you know what I mean? Like saying, oh, maybe I can do the same thing, you know, with, with my wife or my partner. Um, so, so, yeah, and, you know, once again, it, it comes down to the videos, I think, uh, that you produce because they are so engaging. But I was wondering kind of like, what originally piqued your interest in filmmaking back in the day? Well, I'm, I'm writing my book at the moment about that. And that sort of sets up my story of being, becoming a storyteller because in, in all honesty, I, you know, I turned 40 last month and I've probably only been a good storyteller for five or six years where I'm really becoming a bit more genuine about what to tell and what not to tell. Um, and that's not this whole warts and all thing. It's more showing insight, you know. The PhD mm. has taught me you must show insight. Otherwise, you're just writing what likely someone else has written before. So um, I suppose when I went, when I first took a camera with me, it was to walking to Everest Base Camp as a 19-year-old. As a and I wanted to do some illegal climbing up Everest itself. So I wanted to take the camera to show young Bo as a, an aspiring mountaineer but nothing of the story of Nepal or Bo even, more just, I wanted to be a boa here on the side of a mountain. Um, and I got back and, you know, I'd lugged this bloody old camera around and it was, a sh you know, it was a shit camera and it was shit footage and it was a wake-up call to, I didn't know it then, but it's sort of, it's, I certainly know it now, that um, 
the heroic footage and the heroic adventures are quite easy. And so I, I think I think by the time I got to Africa and was paddling around the coast then, and that was such a long process too, you know, that was sort of, that was an eight month shoot and a five month paddle. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really, um, I had to show, I had to show background. I had to show insight and I started to enjoy it. And it was a bit of a, it was a, it was a wake up call to storytelling. What, what do you mean by insight exactly? Like, well, that's, that's a good point. So insight is, um, this harks back to my PhD. I did, when you write a PhD, you have to come up with how you are going to draw out knowledge from whatever data you're trying to create. Because a PhD has to create data of some kind, and whether it's on yourself or on your best mate or on gardens or on the universe. You create data and you say something about it, and you have to say something about it that's different or that hasn't been said before. Now, that has to be rigorous. So you then have to choose the tools that make it rigorous, and that's called methodology. So I chose my methodology, and in, in a sense, my theory too is what they call um, phenomenology. It's about the phenomenology of lived experiences. Mm -hmm. And the doyens of, you know, the, the people that created this thing, it came out of Germany a hundred years ago and it's been poked and prodded by all these very smart people. And they, phenomenology about lived experiences is about getting to the essence of what your lived experience is. Mm -hmm. So when I go for a swim down at the river, what is, that, what is the essence of that experience? Why do I give a damn about it? Why do I want to be in that river right now? What is it giving me? Is it the coolness of the water on me? Is it because I can take a selfie and put it on Insta? Is it because I look good or I feel good or I want to go fishing or I like the feeling of sand in, the, in my toes? Whatever, you know? And, and so they are the essences and, and that is what insight is. Insight shows essences. And so that's a long-winded <laughs> answer to your question, but... These are the things I'm starting to understand more about life. Yeah. And what I love about that is, so you go. Um, no, you go, bud. What I love about that, what I love about that as well is, is that I think by you understanding that insight is important, that it can make your own lived experience better because you're actually thinking about what are the insights that I'm getting out of this, you know? So it's not, it's, if you look at it beyond the storytelling aspect, if you just look at it as this is my life, like what are my insights why am i doing things what is the intentionality behind my actions and my and my thoughts and my me and my uh, you know my all the things i do which is yeah. actually a really great um tool so so thanks for sharing that with us no and you're dead right i mean i think you folks you guys are really insightful in the way that you draw insight from others in a sense and i dare say you know harking back to ambition knowing, you know, I'm seeing you both in your scenes and they're beautiful, clean, organized scenes. I bet, I bet your ambition has really good, you know, your day to day, I imagine would be really well managed. You know, you'd be really dialed in on maximizing your day. So I dare say that your insights are thinking along those lines too, because insight breeds insight or, or the, the knowledge of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's well put. Uh, yeah. Cool. That's very kind of you to say. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> thank you. I yeah. guess. Yeah. We, 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 we are quite structured, I guess, in our days and we try to, provide as much value as we can. Uh, that's for sure. So, so, but just, just one thing that you said there, which, which is, which is, I think is really important for people to understand is actually the amount of work that goes into producing a video, you know, or film or documentary like you do, you said you rode for five months, but you film for eight months, you know, like, and, and then, and, and then I'm, you know, there's the process of editing and creating the narrative around it. It's like, can you just give us a little bit of maybe insight into that, like how, how it works? Yeah, great question in that um, it's really intimidating uh, writing a book or writing a, a, or making a film in a sense because of the choice of the ways you can tell a story and the tools of that, doing that, you know. So most undergraduate students have two or 3,000 words in their, in their sort of day-to-day -day vocab that they will use to make an assignment. Someone like Shakespeare had about 10,000 words. Uh, a filmmaker will have lots more, um, I suppose, a wider palette or a wider understanding of what shots they can make to tell the story that they've got in their head. So Bass by Kayak, which was on my PhD, um, we had about 30 hours of footage of that and it ended up being one hour worth of film. You know, So you've got to reduce 30 hours down to one hour now, of that 30 hours too, 
new cameras these days, right? They have slow-mo and fast-mo and whatever, and you're shooting at 24 to 90 frames per second. And so extrapolate 30 hours with all of those frames and each one of those frames can tell a different story and show something different. And so it's super intimidating to then break that down. Hmm. And that's ultimately where you have to have a sit in a dark closet by yourself and say, right, I go, what story do I want to tell here? And, and that's one of my failings is that I'll often want to tell multiple stories with the one batch of footage and you've hmm. got to make all these compromises and they're freaking hard to make, you know? So I'm getting better at that and being more decisive, but I, I'm starting to get more help too because uh, I'm learning that that's a really good method, <laughs> getting mm. help and getting advice and getting an editor who has an opinion. You know, it's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember watching like one, on one of your, I think it was the, the Bass Strait one where you like literally, I don't know, it felt like you had like 15 or 20 different like folders and you're like, cool, this story could go this way or this way or this way. And then you just kind of threw it down this passage and I was like, whoa that's a hectic <laughs> sort of decision to make like in terms of where where this sort of narrative and story goes yeah that's right and i yeah and I, I i really do struggle with that sometimes too um i wrote which i shot the introduction to my latest film yesterday at an old abandoned homestead well a house really not really a homestead on a, on a farming district and and i i conceived of this idea a few weeks ago but after yesterday and being there and having a script in front of me that i'd written that morning everything kind of went out the window mm. uh, based on what i was being inspired by in this old house so i thought oh shit i've wasted all this time writing ah. a script and being inspired in one particular direction when you get to the house i'm thinking all these other things so <laughs> um it takes a fair bit to trust that instinct and either follow your, your tangent or go back to what you you think is your bread and butter. Um, yeah, so, and, and then, you know, you've got the crew there and you've got all this energy around you and you're trying to bloody make things up on the fly. It's really frustrating for both you and them. So you've got to, <laughs> yeah, in any, any case, yeah, it's, it's hard. Films are hard. Um, wow. and, and the more that you're willing to follow your tangents, the harder they are. Hmm. Well, it sounds, once again, it sounds quite analogous to life, <laughs> you know, like, you know, there's so many options we have and at some stage you have to make decisions and choose and the prep work versus gut and all these things. And, and, and yeah, I think it's, uh, I love how there's this sort of parallel um, narrative there, you know, as well. But I was wondering just out of interest, like as a sort of an aside, like, do you, do you do some kind of meditation or something like that where you are able to witness your thoughts and sort of, filter through all these things that are potentials and then and do you have like what is your process there um i do not do any kind of formal anything in a sense although i have run um gee i had six months off then when i was sad and and didn't want to run and i just i was sort of over it for a lot of reasons it was in between um helen and my former girlfriend and i just sort of that was the only time in my life that i haven't really run and so I've run between three and seven times a week for 25 years. So I've always run, right? Thousands of kilometers. And that's where I do my thinking. You know, uh -huh. That's where Isaac Newton did his thinking. That's where Einstein came up with E equals MC squared by going for a walk at 2 a.m., you know, couldn't sleep. So I do my thinking when I, when I run, uh, which is a pretty, you know, pretty you know, you said before we've got so many choices and we do, uh, but I'm starting to realize how bloody lucky I am to have all those choices too. Mm. You know, I'm a lucky white bloke. Um, mm, they sure. grew up in a middle-class family with an education and never thought twice about not being a, a fireman or a builder or a doctor or a, a garbage sweeper. You know, I could be any of those things if I chose. Yeah, no, you're very right. It's a, it's a good reminder that just how lucky most of the people listening to this right now Ah, oh, you know what I mean? So, uh, thank you for that. So look about you've, you've done some superhuman challenges as we've been speaking about, uh, like, like, as you mentioned, the, you know, the, the, um, Bass Strait paddling across Australia, the, um, you know, you, you kayaked from Mozambique to Cape town, which is crazy. And, uh, you know, running the old, uh, train lines of Victoria, but these are just obviously just a few of them, but what goes into preparing for an adventure like this and, and how do you sort of rope people in to, to help you with these massive feats? Well, I've got a really, uh, up until a few years ago, up until Bass Strait, it was very much Bogue takes out a camera, shoots whatever I can, 
pretty poorly, pretty badly, really. And then I'd find whoever was willing <laughs> uh, to help me make it into something. Um, and they were okay, but they, not like they are now where I have some other vested interests or basically some people that give a damn about my story as much as me. And that's maybe where I'm quite, I'm, I have to constantly be humble about what the hell I'm doing because these other people are helping me tell this story. So my key partner is Mitch Drummond, his name is, and he's the guy behind a camera a lot of the time now. And then we have some other really close friends that come along, Chris Ord and Brett Campbell. And um, used to do my music and now does the sound engineering. And so Dave Cuthy, we've got, I've got these really guys I really trust creatively that, that know that this story has got legs and that it's a, just a good story. You know, it's mm. not, I'm not trying to be preachy or reinvent the wheel or whatever. I'm just telling a story. And if the story's got legs, then they're on board and then it becomes a shared project. So uh, I've just found good allies creatively. And I suppose it's like a band, you know, I basically just have a band. <laughs> yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> we, we, um, we were actually talking about that before Gareth and I, like you come across it and not a preachy at all, which is, which is really, really awesome and a great trait. Um, but um, I can imagine coming sort of coming back from an expedition like that must be sort of bittersweet in some ways, obviously even now it's even obviously quite different with a little one, but um, you know, you are the highs and lows and, and, and sort of what are the emotions that go through when you've been through some of these big things? Um, is it Salvador Del Dali? It was he the one that was really abstract and well, yeah. I mean, he's one of many, but those, those super twisted sort of landscapes that don't make much sense. And that yet they're very interesting. Um, I think he's most well renowned for this idea of surrealism or being surreal. And people say that a lot. They say, oh, I was so surreal. It was so epic or, mm. you know, we say literal all the time now where, where things aren't literal at all, but if I'm to give you a definition of surreal, um, it, it's, it, it tends to only happen to me after expeditions, after something that's tough or challenging or embodied or so bloody full on where all you're doing is just doing that one thing. And it's often pretty easy. You just got to do it for a long time and repeat, 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 like paddling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that when I finished the Alpine run, you know, I ran across the Australian Alps and I, I had... My, you know, I got in the shower at that, the end day on day 14 and I was home and I've had a glass of champagne and felt like I was the most drunk I've ever been and got in the <laughs> shower and that shower and you're watching this, the, the water run down over you and you're watching the last remains of the dirt from the track go off your legs and, and the shower felt like exactly the same shower I'd had two weeks earlier before I left. <laughs> and it was like, shit, you know, I, did that, did this all just happen? You know, did wow. I just run 700 Ks across the mountains and I hear I'm standing here as this other version of myself. And yet this big thing has just happened. And yet here I'm in the same spot thinking similar thoughts. Uh, that to me was surreal. You know, I'm mm -hmm. thinking your mind becomes a movie scene. You're just thinking shit. It was amazing. And so, I, I imagine that a lot of people have that after big experiences. I imagine that war veterans, uh, when they come back and they go mm. back to driving a, a crappy old car in a street with no uniform on, and they've been driving tanks with a uniform in exotic places in the mm. world, it must be a, a real spin out for them to think, I've just changed lives so drastically. Mm. Mm. Wow, man. Totally. They also talk about, um, you spoke about, you know, the artist in that case, um, uh, but but Salvador Dali, but they also talk about um, the sublime in philosophy and in art, and um, and th this is sort of somewhat of the idea of like these, like the ocean can be seen as sublime because it's so powerful and so awe-inspiring and and scary and dangerous, but also really beautiful. And yeah. I'm sure you've you've probably seen yeah innumerable number of these kinds of things on 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 some of these uh, trips. Well, I think you might be leading me, leading me down the garden path there because um, there's one of my episodes of Bass by Kayak. Um, I think it's episode four where we do the long crossing from Deal Island to Kilcranky Bay, it's called. And, you know, that's where we, we had a what we thought was going to be a 12 or 14 hour crossing from one island to another. And it ended up being closer to 18 hours. And so we're paddling for the last four or five hours of the day in complete darkness. And... Um, 
in just before that time, after there was a riffle of a wind and there was always a bit of a head swell and uh, it calms off, glassy seas, and then these big rainbows emerge right mm-hmm. before dusk. And it was sublime. It was straight out of a, holy shit, you know, I've got this mm-hmm. massive panorama landscape in front of me and it's putting on a show. And wow. I felt like I was in a painting. Wow, man. Yeah. And, and, and but do you ever so, have like any kind of like epiphanies or like, you know, like you've just touched now, you just had like moments that are unforgettable of any kind of things like that, that you kind of recall? Uh, not well. Um, and once again, they're probably more in hindsight than in the moment. Uh, cause you've got to allow yourself time to have epiphanies because often when you, and a lot of my projects are pretty hectic. And I, cause I know I want to either get the shoot done or I want to get to where I'm going or, I, or I'm thinking, or I'm thinking in very much these sort of constant loops of, of things going on. Um, and it, yeah, an epiphany takes time. And, and I did have one recently when I, I recently ate my body weight in, in beans. So I read a Steinbeck book and that's my next film that's coming out shortly. And halfway through that process. So for 39 days, all I ate is beans out of tins. And halfway through it, I've just been to a conference in Western Australia and I was giving a talk and I couldn't have the banquet that they put on that night. And I left and went back to the airport. And as I'm leaving from the the presentation to the airport, it was about a four hour drive and halfway along, I stopped and sat on the curb at a, at a trucker stop at a petrol station and just thought, you know what, this is, this is crazy. Why, why am I, eating only beans, I feel horrible, I've got no energy, I can't run or not well, um, social life's gone to crap and I'm grumpy all the time. And I just, I just thought the epiphany was that, you know, food and culture, food culture and, and what we can do with food and, and our lucky natures of, of eating food in our banquet supermarkets is just remarkable. Wow. Um, and it sort of was a bit deeper. It felt a bit deeper than just this whole perspective of, you know, wow. when, you, when you see poverty, it make, you're supposed to have a perspective puller on your wealth. Uh, well, it, was, it just felt deeper than that. I felt like I'd really, I'd, um, I'd persecuted myself and I'd given myself a window into what persecution is, such as, you know, one meal a day or bad food hmm. or malnutrition, you know. Wow, yeah, man. yeah. Jeez. Look, these are, yeah, yeah, yeah. These these are massive like lessons. You know what I mean? I think lots yeah. of people will never realize these things because they probably never set themselves challenges or or maybe travel and and get to experience these things. Um, I've spent the last five months on the road, and you know that was like four months of it has been in in Asia, and wow. But it's really, it's really just reminded me how flippin' lucky we are. You know, in in our lives. You know, like. Wow, we, we, we kind of make, sometimes we make stuff out of nothing, you know, where there's not really a problem. And, and the, the, you know, there's so many other people that are really, really suffering. And we kind of need to really remind ourselves how lucky we are kind of every single day, um, just to flip and be alive, actually. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing, like, for us that we find, like, is really, really important is, is community. And uh, you've obviously done a lot of, like, solo expeditions, um, but then also your Bass Strait was a group one. Uh, do, do you feel like you have any kind of favorites and, and maybe why as well? Yeah, I wrote about that in my PhD and that I'd gone from doing lots of, so- and I'm very solo orientated because I believe in humans operating at their own pace. You know, we all listen to the, a certain type of music based on our probably our heart rate. And, and mm-hmm. I don't know, it's kind of a soulful thing is going or run at your own pace or swim at your own pace or walk or weed the garden at your own pace. Mm. You know, I think they're really nice things. And so I think that's my native kind of uh, default. But when I went with these guys across Bass Strait, it was very much about that camaraderie. And, and originally the study was supposed to be about expeditionary travel and the dynamics of that socially. And through the study, it changed and changed and ended up being more about storytelling and, uh, identity and a few other things but it was so good to experience that trip with guys I really liked you know it was it was so excellent you know it was fun I trusted them they're really good guys and so um it went from being you know expeditions and to me in the past have been quite hard you know and I and I enjoy the moments within the expedition but not just a whole day like I would like I did on Bass Bucket Kayak 
I enjoyed the whole experience because I had these guys around me. If I'd been there by myself, I would have enjoyed the meal after the crossing or, or the sunset or when dolphins come and play with you, you know, moments throughout the day rather than just this cluster of guys that I really liked being with. So it was, it was, it was a real shift up for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can actually totally relate to that. But uh, when I was watching it, um, it reminded me I went on a trip, uh, like, I don't know, 10 years ago or something with all Aussie mates of mine, because I used to live in London, right? And all my mates are Aussies, I played Aussie rules and stuff. And uh, I went with these guys to Sweden and Sweden has like, like I don't know, massive amounts of like sw- uh, fjords, you know, like little islands and that. And um, uh, we were like, cool, let's go kayak around these fjords for five days. And we pulled up our little kayaks um, with beer and like, you know, just perishable foods or, or, or non-perishable food. I can't remember what the hell we ate actually. Um, and um, yeah, it was just the best experience ever. We didn't know each night, we didn't know where we were going to sleep. Uh, we had a starting point and an end point. And it was just like, let's go with the flow, see what happens. And you kind of like, you just have such a great bonding moment and like yeah. these memories that you'll never forget, you know, as, as a group of buddies, like, and uh, yeah, it's a really, really cool times and good memories, man. Oh, they do. They totally shape your life. And we, I catch up with my best friends for three days, two or three days every year at the Queen's birthday weekend. So in June sometime here in Australia, we all get together and, you know, we drink lots of beer and play lots of sport and, and stay up late and talk rubbish. And it's really, it's a great time. And we're often you know, you, you really only know each year to the next based on where you went because you essentially do the same things, say the same stuff, wear the same clothes half the time, you know, maybe someone's got a new car, but otherwise nothing really changes. And, and gee, we like it like that too. And it's quite important to vi- visit the past again and to really, yeah, pull up all of these fun stuff that happened during our formative years. Mm. <laughs> yeah, totally. Reminiscing is, a, is such a powerful uh, stress reliever in some ways too it just feels good yeah. <laughs> so uh, Bo you're um, someone who obviously you know loves upcycling and, and is not a big fan of waste at all um, you've you've got some great metaphors for different types of uh, wasters um, how, how, how can we all be a little bit better at reusing things and wasting less in your opinion um well, that exactly that you, you just said it. You know, uh, use less, waste less. I suppose fundamentally, it comes back, and I still waste too much, uh, or rather, buy too much. I recycle everything, or or reuse it. Reusing is better than recycling, but better than all that is not buying it in the first place, hmm. and making it yourself, or making it out of something you've already got, or wouldn't have thought that you could make it out of. Um, it does require some skills, but it doesn't require much skill. It just requires a bit of thought. Um, and, and it's, I mean, we're just awfully lucky. We're, we're in this sort of petrochemical revolution and we're trying to redefine that. I think a lot of us are, and I think that's really, it's needed and, and great. Um, and I, you know, I'm sort of constantly trying to go back to the older ways of my grandparents and yet they're the, my grandparents and my father's generation, they're the ones that have, destroyed australia <laughs> in a mm-hmm. sense i don't blame them in, at, at all and yet that's the generation that has taken australia from a you know from 98 percent forestry 150 years ago down to 42 or 47 or something mm-hmm. so okay th- they've done these things and they did them without realizing that that was going to cause these problems perhaps uh so me wanting to go back to these really sort of um romantic times of my grandparents and father has to be has to be a kind of modern version of that mm. um, of using oil wraps over your food rather than cling wrap and making your lunch boxes or making your food and having a veggie patch and all these things. So I'm just trying to, tr- I'm trying to come up with this transition of what is being a good human that's, um, that's educated and it doesn't take the piss out of the current people or the mm. ones that have been here for a lot longer. And, um, mm. Just, just thinking about our stuff. We're, we're so materialistic. We just, just think about it. But we know this too. So it's about caring about that. You know what? Yeah. But I, 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 do you think people really know about it though? I, I don't know if like everyone's kind of like as self-aware and aware as as yourself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's a, and I know I'm lucky that I'm self-aware because of critical parents and because of a PhD and lots of education and being forced to think mm. uh 
and maybe that was my natural instinct anyway, I don't know, but I, I, I do like to think about lots of things and, and particularly when I'm wrong and to think about why I was wrong or why I think something didn't work. Um, but you're right. I know that a lot of people don't, I, I've got some of my closest friends that geez, they waste a lot of stuff, you know, mm. and yet I know they're really good people and they, they do their own form of recycling or not buying and, but ultimately it's probably not sustainable. We can't all, we can't all live like them. And to be honest, we probably all can't live like me either. So we've, we've yeah, I just question things and you're right. We don't all do that. Mm, it comes back to that, those insights again, in some way, isn't it? Like what, what are we doing with our stuff? Like, and you're obviously, you know, you've spoken quite a lot about minimalism as well. And I like this idea that you are buying and making stuff now to use on your hundredth birthday. Like that's the kind of, a uh, long game that we got to think about stuff. We, we, we just, we, it's so easy to throw stuff away, isn't it? And, uh, and just buy a new one. It's ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, I know some cultures think, yeah. Yeah. Just this stuff that comes and goes into our, I just think it's bonkers. We really need to shake that up. And I don't think it's the government's role either. You know, sure, we can vote in people that really dig that sort of stuff. But I think we've just got to, we're going to take a bit more ownership of that stuff. You know, I don't blame the government for anything in some respects, because we are the government. We've got to, we've got to trump that somehow. Not yeah. Mr. Trump, Trump it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Is, there, is there something to be said? You, I mean, Gareth, you covered a banking background. You'd probably have some opinion on this, but doesn't like buying stuff and all that help the economy, help people that are less fortunate. I mean, I don't know how that fits in. If everyone started to change that, does that not affect um, like how um, maybe the less fortunate people end up? Well, I, I don't know. Like, yeah, structures will change. Structures will fall and they have to change and they have to fall mm -hmm. because fundamentally, you know, we're all with deep within this system of development or of progress or of growth, mm -hmm. you know, our banks where we keep our money are only so damn powerful because they get more powerful from one year to the next. Mm. Now, what if they just stayed the same sort of powerful that they are now, you know, and didn't have that 2.8% growth or 4.6 or 6.8 and they were just zero, zero and their aim was zero, zero. We want to be the same next year. Mm. So the shares wouldn't get bought because another bank's doing one or two or 6%. And so, that, yeah, the, the, the capitalist structure, and my wife knows more about this than me. Uh, she's, a, she's a business owner, and so she wants to use capitalism for, uh, as a force for good. And I constantly question her. I say, oh, how do you do that? You know, is, are we just going to screw the world for 100 years to try and work out how to do that? Um, and so I'm critical of that. because I, But then we can't all go back and live in bark huts um, by the side of a river anymore. I think we've gone beyond that. We're, we're an urbanized world where the iPhone rules, you know, and mm. so it's a challenge. It's hugely challenging. Mm. Um, yeah, but I, tell I don't I, think, yeah, I, I don't think a keep cup's going to do it or, or, or a hybrid car even. I think, um, well, I don't know. I hope, I hope to think those things make a difference, but I think there needs to be a sense of radicalism and I, and I, and I know that that's a dangerous word and, yeah. I'm not there yet. I'm not radical myself. So I've still got to, I've got to do some homework. Yeah. What, what do you mean by radical exactly? Well, I know that I, I, um, I'm a fairly, uh, opinionated, listened to person in the classroom with my students. And so I will say that, yeah, these things are, are good and these things are bad based on theory or research or whatever. And try not to make them my opinion. But if I give them those tools and those opinions in a certain way, they're going to believe those things. And so it might be something like um, water usage, eating ethically, uh, buying ethical clothes, buying ethical down, for example. Um, I, I know that even great people and people like myself, even we still go against these things that we know aren't good. Mm. And when I know myself that I still don't make, uh, well, I still think I compromise way too much. And if I've got all these opinions and I'm an opinion maker and, uh, you know, someone who's influential of others and I don't do those things, I can see the fallibility of humans. Mm. Absolutely. Because I'm still making compromises. I bloody shouldn't be. Hmm. I've just been to the supermarket now and bought 
things in plastic I bloody shouldn't have. I should have gone to a co-op two days ago to buy the same kind of foods without plastic. And mm. I didn't. Yeah. Because of time restrictions, because it's hot, because I wasn't in town, whatever. But they're excuses, right? So mm. I just know how hard it is to be um, uh, really moral because, yeah, because I make compromises and I know that I'm, I'm someone who's fairly opinionated. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. It's a tough thing to navigate. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And just kind of tying into that, like you're obviously like a very kind of philosophical guy and uh, you like, like questions a lot. Um, in fact, you say it's important to, to question questions and you know, question everything and question questions. How, why is that important? And like, how do you kind of like encourage or teach people to do that? Uh, I've always thought, and my films hopefully do this more and more, is, um, is not be preachy and just monkey see, monkey do. So that's where I think the power of influence is. is um, I'm most influenced by, by characters that I see doing really genuine things. Mm. You know, if someone's to make a film about picking up rubbish, yeah, great. If I see someone doing it without them knowing I'm watching them do it, mm. I'm, I'm their I'm, I'm bloody hero for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. because they've done it for this pure reality and morality that I think is just awesome. And so um, I like to just, you know, whatever I ask of my students, I'm going to do that and lots of other things around it that make it seem like this is the norm and, and hopefully that, that, that that's the influence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it certainly comes across that way just so you know, bud. so you, you do a great yeah, job thanks. of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, very much the doing versus the saying and and you've certainly you've certainly got that and once again it comes back to knowing what are those values that you hold dear and when we all need to actually sit down and and in a in the room on our own with no no one looking at us and see what are those things like what are the real things that um that make me me and my character and who i am uh, and if you don't know yourself who those are then others will dictate to you um, so, it's, and I think you've spent that time thinking about that, which is super powerful. Uh, hence, why you you know you know what you're doing, except on the odd occasion with a plastic. But uh, we know we all forgive you for that one. <laughs> so um, I recycle it, but then I think, and and I know that by recycling it, I'm keeping people in jobs, and the plastic will get reused somewhere else. And every you know everything that's in the planet, right, just gets pushed and poked and prodded around. But and I know now that we've got really good processes with plastic, but that's still a process that had to have been invented because we use all this plastic, you know, yeah. uh, it's a, it's a real, yeah, <laughs> we'll navigate this until we die. Right. How yeah. we, how we spend our morality. Totally. Mm. And, and so, Bo, so many people are, are looking for fun, adventure and happiness. Obviously, you know, we'll contemplate these things and, um, and you started to do and explore your immediate surroundings rather than always traveling afar. Um, as you mentioned earlier, a little bit, um, and it's actually quite amazing what's sort of right underneath our nose, isn't it? And if we just sort of take a bit more notice and, and, and look, hey. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I, um, I didn't do any writing this morning. The heat sort of got to me in the end and I, my brain was a bit fried. But I'm two-thirds of the way done with my, my book. The working title is The Backyard Adventurer. Mm. And uh, that's very much about that, how my, my sense of perception from long range pursuits has shifted to sort of more backyard stuff. And that's half the time that's just practical because I've got a wife and a child now and a mm. small farm I want to be on. Um, and I don't want to be burning up CO2 all the way to always go to Nepal or New Zealand just to climb a mountain. So um, yeah, there's just this tremendous amount of stuff around us. And a lot of it's kind of ugly too, but you know, if I was to think that the highway between here and wherever I'm going, is this kind of wilderness, which it is for me, because I never, you know, uh, being by the roadside is full on, right? I could get <laughs> killed by something any minute. There's no shade, you know, it's dangerous. It's it's like what people have said about wilderness for many years, that an animal's going to kill me um, or I'm going to you know, <laughs> melt in quicksand or something, you know? And so they're much the same thing, a roadside a mega highway and the depths of, of the jungle. So... Yeah, I think why not? Let's exploit this. Let's have a look at it, and it can say something about the human condition and yourself when you do it. Yeah, totally, bud. And and just like that that ninety kilometer walk you did to work. I mean, wow, you know, like how many people never actually walk to work because we just have cars and we we never get to experience 
everything along the way. It's quite crazy, yeah. Yeah, it really is. You know, my um, my parents uh, still live in a suburban street in Melbourne, and they're having to take out trees in clusters near the school because there's so many parents now drop their kids off. Mm. And virtually none of the kids ride their bikes anymore. Mm. This is a girls' school, and I'm not sure if a girls' school or a boys' school is more prominent, but they're taking out bloody trees so that they can people can drive their kids to school rather than the kids who they all live within two or three k's away wow. should ride their bikes or walk or skateboard or carpool i don't know but it's just bonkers how how car centric we are now and we just don't get ourselves places you know mm. i must yeah. i must say living in uh, in holland for for some time uh it really it hit home coming from South Africa, especially in Johannesburg. It's a big city. I, I never went anywhere without the car. Yeah. And when I got, you know, a lot of the kids I, I would see at work, um, they would cycle 10 Ks to, to school and 10 Ks home. And um, it's just such a, that's a real simple thing that more people could do is just ride their bikes. So it's like, it's, yeah. it's actually phenomenal what a difference it makes. Oh, my wife's a commuter and she's commuted for 10 years on a bike. And not only does she get a daily workout, but she just, it's, you know, a bit like me with my running and, and about uh, meditation you were talking about earlier. That's, that's where she solves the problems of the world, you know, and, and becomes a gun bike rider and really fit and does it and saves on car parking, saves on car spaces, saves on the car on top. You know, it's awesome. It's win-win um, for kids. It's, teaches them spatial awareness, challenge, hardship, uh, the joys of things and they've got freedom. They're not in their yeah. bloody parents' car. They can be on their bike and go off and buy something with someone or have an ice cream with a girlfriend or a boyfriend after school because they've got their own wheels. Yeah, yeah so yeah. cool. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking of E.T. now, bud, when you say that, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. all the kids like cycling around on their bicycles <laughs> and their roads. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, classic. But but so so um what, what, what does, you know, people talk a lot about like happiness and, and these sort of things. And, you know, there's obviously you know, different ways to find it, but what does it actually mean to you, happiness? That's another, you guys are asking good questions because um, I, uh, we were given recently a book um, about making happy children. You know, when you have, a, have your first child, everyone gives you books about how to raise children, which are just, they're really good. They're good sentiments. They're well written. They're bestsellers. You know, millions of people have read these books, and one of them that Helen's reading at the moment. And I've only read the blurb, so I'm ganging up on this book for probably <laughs> the wrong reasons. But, um, I don't necessarily. I'm not in pursuit of happiness, and I, nor will I teach our child to be in pursuit of happiness. Uh, I, I want to teach fortitude and and mm. challenge and friendliness. I'd teach friendliness over happiness any day of the week. And I'm, I, don't, I don't think my day is happy. I I'm not a happy kind of person. I'm really optimistic. Mm. I'm super optimistic. But I'm not overly happy. I, I don't mind not being not happy. And, and that's why I don't mind running because running half the time is not happy. You're bloody slogging your guts mm. up a hill somewhere and you, you feel every sinew in you and it's much easier to walk. And then you'd see bird songs and, and you'd appreciate things and you'd probably be happier by walking, you know? So I've got a pretty skewed sense of this happiness because I reckon happiness is pretty easy. Happiness is going for a walk and getting drunk every afternoon uh, because it gives you that, that pocket, that sense of thing that we're after, like a sugar hit, you know? And I think it's, I'd rather look for all the other stuff because happiness is just going to happen in pockets anyway, hmm. especially if I'm challenged and show fortitude and I've had through whatever you know i just think throw everything else at it and happiness will come mm. Love it. yeah and i totally agree with that i don't think the meaning we're not here on earth to be happy it's that like the meaning of life is not necessarily happiness it's just that it's reducing suffering perhaps and and try to like you know have happy moments and tre treasure those but you know it, it, it's unreasonable to think that every moment of everyone's life is going to be happy and, and when it's not yeah. that suddenly you like devastated, you know, so I think yeah. it's a good mindset. Yeah. No, it's well said, you, uh, you know, this sort of boiling down all of these sort of, I love the fact that I'm sitting here. I, I don't know whether you can see it, but I am, I'll show you a sweat line. There's a sweat line between nice. 
And you see the sweat, <laughs> yes. the sweat line there? Yeah. <laughs> yes. My whole torso is just in sweat because I'm hot. It's, it's, it's a 41 degree day here or something. I don't want to live in a 22 degree house the whole time, <laughs> which is just, well, <laughs> but, <laughs> You know, when we smooth things out and, and every coffee store sells the same coffee with the same sort of hipster person behind there and the same decor and Ikea picture on the wall, you know, stuff that. I, I want diversity and difference. And if I was happy all the time, that's kind of what I feel like that would be doing. It's gentrifying the human existence. You know, I want some unpleasantness and I want some hot days and some cold days and some times when I'm deeply unhappy. Um, because... Yeah, I, I reckon I reckon animals are very much the same. You know, they have booms and busts because when they're they're laying there and they've got a belly full, and then they're bloody hungry for a week because mm. they can't catch whatever they're catching or whatever. <laughs> and I imagine that uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind living the same kind of way. Yeah, that's it. cool, man. Oh, Bo, look, I, one of the questions we want to ask, and and it's kind of hard to top such a, a bit of a mic drop moment there, but. Um, so, so sort of bring it home a little bit. What are two bits of advice that you could offer people listening to this that have really helped you in your life? Yeah, I, I really suck at these questions because I'm never sure where to start, you know? Um, and, and Helen and I talk about this, about our parenting with May now, you know, what are, what are we going to, what are the X factors that we, we bring to May as her parents? And I suppose in, in a sense, that's what you've asked because mm. I care for no more person on this earth right now other than Helen as, as May, this little creature who we are the key manipulators of right now. Mm. And so that sense of freedom um, is, is very good to never feel at risk from, and yet I know that they, they all serve massive purposes to feel risk and to feel vulnerable are good in a sense. I suppose then, being the questioning sort that I am it is to question things is to, mm. uh, you know, don't, don't suffer the status quo and make yourself better. Don't do it because you want to do it for anyone else. Make it because you probably should. <laughs> mm. um, we're, we're racing towards 10 billion people. So we just need to be better humans because there's so many of us on the planet. Mm. There are going to be so many of us. We need to be better. So just try and make yourself better. And we all know what it is. That's the, that's the trick. We all know we could do five things tomorrow that make us better. <laughs> and yeah, well, I don't need to spell them out because I don't know what they are, but I reckon, I reckon we all know it. Mm -hmm. Massive. Yeah, definitely, Rad. So, so, yeah, so I only gave you one then, but it's so bloody big. I reckon there's probably two or five or eight in it. I don't know. No, no, yeah. that was that was power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, Rad. So, 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 look, uh, you you mentioned at the start of the chat that uh, you've actually um, stopped uh, teaching at Monash. Um, so, kind of, and you're writing your book. Obviously, um, you, you're quite a way through it. So, like, what are you most excited about the future? Um, and like, what else do you have coming up? And, and then also how can people get in touch with you if they, you know, want to follow uh, this legend of a man? Yeah, look, um, Insta, I'm on Insta man now, Boisms, Boisms on Insta, but otherwise just YouTube's got a, you know, there's, there's 20 odd films up there. 10 of them are really crackers and I think 10 are kind of fillers, but you know, they're all, there's all something to say in most of them. Um, so Bo Miles at YouTube is really where it's at and that's what I'm going to be flogging this year. Uh, I'm going to try and get 12 films out this year and there's about mm -hmm. five in the can already that they've been shot now. They've just got to be made into a real story. Um, so yeah, they're the big things. I'm really excited about not knowing where this year's going to go. I'm going to go to the U S and do some shooting in June. I've got a film idea there. I really want to try and pull off. And so that's exciting. Uh, I film with my wife and daughter. We're going to go for a hike this year for an extended hike and film it all. And that'll be, that'll be really fun. I've never done that. You know, I never hiked with that, with um, someone who's my daughter before. Uh, <laughs> and look, I've got to really put praise on the people who essentially, I was made redundant at Monash university hmm. um, for, for all the right reasons. I think, you know, there was, there's not a lot of animosity there, but uh, it's, it's done me such a huge favor. Cause I, hmm. I just didn't quite realize how much I was, I was, I'm a pretty boring nine to fiver. I have been for years. And so I'm now back to having to chase my own money and chase my creativity and, and chase whatever it is I want to do. And so that's, that's good. I'm out, I'm out of my comfort zone a bit, which is nice. 
Um, wow. So yeah, I'm no longer I'm no longer getting a check every week, and so I'm. Uh, I think that's good for me. It's really good for me. Hmm. Wow. Awesome, massive, uh, massive thing that so many people we tell ourselves these stories again about money and the and the security thereof and all these things and. Um, yeah, that's just a, it's super encouraging to hear how it's like turned you into more of a creative person and all these kind of things. I think, um, yeah, it's just remember, it's important for us all to remember, you know? So just with our last question here about, um, look, I think you've touched on so many here, um, which probably cover this already, but what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Yeah, it's such a great name for you, for you guys with your podcast. What does it mean to be ridiculously human? Uh, look, I think take no prisoners with, I say this to students, take no prisoners with what you want to do. And then you just become a better human because, you know, you're, you're better to other people because you're, you're more content with what you're doing with your day to day. And that doesn't mean just being happy or lots of money. That means content with what you're doing, you mm. know? Uh, yeah, I think using our body is this, we've got an amazing tool, our hands. We're not just, don't, we don't just have opposable thumbs. We have opposable thumbs. We have an opposable thumb to all four digits. The only primate that can do it. You know, we have these amazing skill sets with our hands that we're only, that I think we're losing, right? So to be ridiculously human is to be, is to have these big, this big fat brain of ours with a body that's really functional. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> love it, bud. So good. Such a good oh, answer. Man. Yeah, man. But listen, um, I just wanted to personally say like a massive thanks for coming on the podcast. Seriously, like um, I'm obviously like a huge fan and uh, you, you're, you're such an inspiring guy. And I think from me where that all comes from is just you being so you and so normal, you know what I mean? So, so you're really, really relatable for uh, for people. And I think the world is kind of, lacking that at the moment you know like you're not trying to be somebody and like you know like you know send some specific message you're just being you and i think that is like marvelous seriously and i flip and dig all the the aussie slang that you use and that once again is just you know you so uh, in your in your awesome non-preachy way you spread this amazing message you know and you get people to think about their own lives and what they're doing and i think cheapers the more people that can do that the better bud so so just thank you for for doing everything that you're doing you know like it's not flipping easy but that's for sure like what you're doing is difficult work you know like uh creating a story spreading a message doing it in a non-preachy way and then all the stuff that goes on in the background you know like so thank you for everything that you're doing you've been everything but uh, and more uh, in this chat so uh yeah just wishing you all the best and and thanks for this connection but it really means a lot to to me and to us and to our listeners thanks guys yeah it's a really nice chat you're good at what you do and um yeah heck we'll do we'll do this again we'll, we'll do yeah. it round two when you've got the next batch in a couple of years time or some more films out or whatever um good on you guys thank nice you. Ch yeah. nice chatting to you thank yeah. you bro. just a real briefly from my side I, I, the one thing that came up when i was listening to you the whole time i was just like Here's this guy who's a philosopher and, and what have you, but so practical. It's this great uh, sort of polar opposites in some ways, you know, but you're almost embodying your philosophy uh, in a sort of really lived out way. And I think that is super inspiring. It's like you, you're almost like this conduit for what you think and what you believe. And it's, it's very tangible. And I think if more of us did that, exactly what you said a, a moment ago, uh, and, and knew what that was, um, I think we'd be in a great place. So we're going to definitely be driving as many people as we can to to follow you specifically and people like you because it's. Um, I just think this is what it's all about. So thanks again and, and have a nice cool uh, shower <laughs> when you're down here. <laughs> and uh, I hope the little one's not too hot. So thanks Good again for everyone. Yeah, I'll go back to being a dad now. So thanks, yeah. fellas. Great Enjoy. to meet you. And uh, I don't think this is the end either. We'll be in touch. Thank I'll you. send awesome. you that, that file through as best I can. It'll be a mother of a file, but I'll that's good. Reduce it or zip it or something. We'll do something. Yeah, perfect. Thank but, you. But, but Thank if you. yeah, so if you don't mind, like you, uh, there's actually um, a WeTransfer. I don't know if you've ever used WeTransfer or the website uh, WeTransfer.com. Um, that's yep. really good for sending files over. 
Um, I'm sure you know this stuff. Um, oh, not very well. No, I'm a bit of a Luddite, really, but I'll, I will <laughs> find it. Um, my, my, yeah, my business partner is great with that stuff, but uh, okay. I've got it here on, on the memory card, and I'm not sure how long an hour and 10 would be, but uh, yeah, no worries. If you, you send me yeah. a link to that, I'll, that I'll send you a link to WeTransfer. So you don't have to register or anything. You literally just upload your file. You can send anything up to two gig for free. Uh, and you say, so and the, the great thing is not having to register, which is also cool. Um, and then in that same, um, that same sort of file uh, that you send over, can you just send us over like four or five, like high spec pics of yourself that we can use on our social media and, and everything like that to sure. promote the podcast and stuff. So yeah. No worries. That'd be awesome. Awesome. And if you're on the Goldie. I'll do the same. I'll um, pump it out to whatever I've got. Oh, thank you, mate. If you're up on Thanks, the Goldie, mate, mate uh, drop, uh, drop me a line. I'd love to catch up and 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 what have you. You've so always got a place to stay. At the moment, Gareth, where are you at the moment? Sorry, you're... but I'm actually in Joburg at the moment. So I'm like, I'm I'm okay. part of my trip. I'm just at home. So yeah. Okay, but you're back yeah. in Australia usually in Sydney. Is that right? Or are you back in the Goldie too? No, but I actually uh, used to live in London. Uh, so we've always r run this kind of like remotely from different places, the podcast. Uh, but I'm moving to Portugal and uh, at the end of this trip. So I'll, I'm going to be there wow. in April. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, to live, to live a life yeah, like sir. you, bud. Like, like we, we bought a nice piece of land and we're going to oh, do flipping Portugal. exactly what you do. Yeah, yeah, bud. Yeah, in Portugal. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Bloody earth. Nice to meet you guys. And if no, I'm up the Goldie, uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk. All right, mate. Yeah, mate. Look <laughs> after yourself. Thanks for that. Good See you later. See ya. Cheers, bud. Bye. Take care, man. See you later, bud. Bye. Bye, guys. Cheers. Craig, I'll send you another link, okay, bud? See you in a sec. Yeah. Cheers, bye. man. Bye-bye. Breaking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging